Good evening to our participants in Asia. Good afternoon to our participants in Africa and Europe, and good morning to our participants in the Americas. For the next, we will uh, have a discussion on the various government responses um, through the beginning of what promises to be a rather long uh, crisis and recovery period. Uh, and to have this discussion, we have uh, chosen a a panel of uh, distinguished speakers who have uh, worked in their respective uh, areas uh, on understanding uh, the initial crisis response and then um, what uh, steps uh, can be followed in various countries around the world in the subsequent uh, recovery. My name is Simeon Diankov. I am a co-policy director at the Financial Markets Group in the London School of Economics. Uh, welcome to uh, everyone. I will first introduce our uh, speakers uh, and then each of them will have eight to 10 minutes to make opening statements, after which we will open the floor to all of you. I will be following the questions that you sent uh, to us in real time. Please uh, name yourself. And also if your question is directed to somebody specific on the panel, also to who that question is uh, directed. And I promise to try to get to as many questions uh, as, uh, uh, as, we, uh, as we can. Welcome also those uh, joining us on, uh, uh, on uh, Facebook. Um, so I'll start by brief introductions with uh, the panelists. Um, we will go in the order in which they appear on the program. Uh, first, uh, Erica Bosio, who is a manager at uh, the World Bank, um, has worked in a number of areas relevant for crisis response um, on uh, public procurement, which is one topic we will be uh, discussing on the survival of uh, small firms uh, in uh, emerging markets and also more recently in the area of informality in developing countries, which is also a topic that uh, we will uh, touch upon. Erica will speak first. Juanita is uh, an assistant professor at uh, the finance department uh, in the London School of Economics. Uh, her uh, research spread several of the topics uh, that are of interest to uh, us today from entrepreneurship to uh, credit, credit guarantee schemes for small, uh, for small businesses, innovation, which um, uh, will be important in the recovery phase of, uh, of the crisis, and more generally, the question of how do businesses react in this type of uh, situations from uh, the beginning to getting finance to some of her latest research uh, is on uh, insolvency uh, regimes. And then finally, uh, Professor Dimitri Vajanos, uh, a Greek uh, uh, economist, director of the financial markets uh, group at, uh, at LSC. Dimitri has uh, uh, spanned a lot of the uh, areas in which uh, we will uh, focus today. Uh, the general area of uh, financing of uh, companies, liquidity of companies, uh, crisis response as well. Um, during and after the last crisis, Dimitri was quite active in proposing solutions both at the European wide level with European safe bonds, um, which are now coming back in favor, as well as the recovery and reform process in uh, his native country, Greece. Um, so we will also have uh, a discussion of some of these uh, bond schemes and uh, recovery schemes that will be uh, relevant uh, for uh, the upcoming uh, several months. Uh, maybe uh, maybe years. So again, please uh, pose your questions on uh, online. I will be going through them and uh, distributing them uh, to the presenters. We will start with Erica. Erica, please, the floor is yours, eight to 10 minutes. Thank you, Simeon, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so the current crisis differs from previous crises that we have faced in three essential ways. Um, firstly, unlike previous crises, this one hits both the demand side and the supply side. Uh, in my own city of Torino, Italy, which as many of you know, has been very hardly hit by the current pandemic, shops are just now starting to reopening. Juventus has not been playing games for a few weeks or months. Fiat is just restarting its production. Um, 
secondly, it's a crisis that is happening simultaneously in the whole world, um, so that you cannot just push the economy by simply reorienting export. And then lastly, uh, it is caused by something that is completely external to the economy. So one can think of it as something like an external shock, like an earthquake or a hurricane. But unlike such events, there is an added uncertainty now around the possibility of a second wave, um, which makes recovery difficult to predict and to plan. Um, it is in this context that one aspect that quickly became very interesting for us was to really to understand the impact of the crisis on firms and specifically on their survival times. So we have started doing some research in this direction that, that just came out that estimates the survival time of firms with less than 500 employees. We're using data from the World Bank Enterprise Surveys and using a sample to begin with of 12 middle and high income countries. So we span continents, we have countries such as Colombia, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Turkey, and Ukraine. To do this, Analysis, we assume that firms have no income in revenues and covered only fixed costs. So the firms itself would be sustaining just costs such as rent or machinery maintenance or the cost of materials. But in turn, we assume that anything like wages or other employee expenses would be covered fully by government schemes. This, of course, is a conservative assumption. So some schemes of this sort have been implemented but rarely cover um, all of employee expenses. But as we did throughout our study, we used many conservative assumptions that are designed essentially to increase the survival times. Um, in doing this research, we find that the medium firm has a survival time that ranges between eight and 19 weeks, um, while the average firms have liquidity to survive between 12 and 38 weeks. Across countries, we see that construction and retail are consistently the weakest sectors, and perhaps even intuitively interesting numbers are coming out from the restaurant business showing the restaurants have less than a month of uh, cash in hand, so showing that their survival times is uh, less than just a month. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, when looking at this data across sectors, we see the firms dealing with the manufacturing of uh, chemical products, mineral products seem to be less cash constrained. But even for these companies, the median uh, survival time is just above four months. So across all of the sectors that we examine, the span retail, construction, and various types of manufacturing, as well as other services, the maximum survival time that we find is just over four months. Um, even within a given sector, we find significant differences across countries. So that, um, for example, in the manufacturing of food products, so we have Portuguese firms with an average survival time that is below two months, about seven weeks. But then we have firms in the same sector in Colombia that display much, much longer um, survival times, tend to be less uh, liquidity constrained and can last up to 26 weeks. Um, of course, when uh, looking at these numbers, one could argue, and in fact, it has uh, been argued before, that the firms that would potentially exit the market are small and inefficient firms. However, um, our research suggests that that, in fact, does not hold up in this uh, context because firms seem to suffer in untimely liquidity, um, regardless of size, age, and productivity, so that these results hold even when we control for, um, for such factors. Um, it is in this context that then the question becomes, um, what are possible responses? Governments have, of course, been thinking about measures to alleviate the impact of this crisis on businesses. Um, several countries have introduced cursor by like schemes. So under such schemes, employee working hours are significantly reduced. Um, however, the employees are not laid off and the state page, uh, pays for a large part of their lost income. So which part depends from country to country. A typical arrangement would be a 60-40 split where the state pays the 60%, but a number of countries have implemented the similar, similar schemes and have adopted the proportion that is paid by the state. France is currently doing 84-60. Uh, in the UK, the coronavirus job retention scheme that was just recently extended for another month set that uh, percentage at 80%. Um, 
Um, nonetheless, what this research shows is that companies will have large debt burdens once the crisis is over and governments have to develop policies to address such indebtedness. Um, incidentally, this is even more true in developing countries when uh, an initial replication of the analysis I was describing that we've been doing for about 35 low-income countries shows that um, the medium firm can only survive about six weeks. So across countries of all income levels, the government response um, is warranted and in low-income countries specifically, also due to other structural issues, the crisis response will be um, even more challenging. Thank you. Thank you, Erika, for setting the uh, stage. Um, uh, so across the world, from rich to, um, uh, to poor countries, uh, firms in this type of crisis have um, only a short period where they can sustain uh, their um, operations, uh, even, uh, as Erika suggests, even with significant government support, uh, for example, through job retention schemes that, according to the International Monetary Fund, more than 100 countries in one way or another already have such schemes uh, uh, in place. But if your revenues are close to zero, um, uh, it's difficult even with this type of percentages to uh, see how business can, uh, uh, can operate, which is why governments have um, also uh, started implementing a number of schemes to finance firms during this process, not just uh, uh, jobs, but through various other uh, schemes. Uh, Juanita is one of the world's top specialists in this uh, area. So Juanita, can you tell us please about some of the uh, schemes that you have researched, what works, what doesn't, what should we uh, think of doing differently, please? Sure. Thank you, Simran. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, well, one of the most popular type of business support programs are loan guarantees that provide firms with access to credit by paying back to banks any loan balances in case of default. Now, this is by no means the first time that governments use this type of program to support businesses. Loan guarantees were actually the most popular type of support program during the Great Recession. Now, the main benefit of loan guarantees is that they can help businesses with no free assets to pledge as collateral to get the cash they need to pay workers and meet other expenses. The main concern is that by providing a guarantee for loans, governments can inadvertently set incentives for firms and banks to take too much risk. Now, to address this concern, governments use three types of levers in the designs of guarantees. First, they ask, for, uh, they ask firms to pay a premium on top of the charges made by lenders. Second, they provide only a partial guarantee to banks. And third, they allow banks to request additional personal guarantees to borrowers, which sets incentives for banks to monitor firms. Now, what did we learn about the success of this program from the Great Recession? I think there are two main lessons. So the first one is that demand for these schemes back then was actually quite low. And I show in my research for the UK that take up was entirely driven by firms that face large costs to hire and train workers. So it would seem then that it was only for these types of firms that it was worthwhile to borrow at above market rates during the recession in order to retain valuable staff that could smooth out the recovery process. To give you some numbers in the UK, fewer than 7,000 companies issued guaranteed loans through the scheme in 2009 which corresponds to less than 5% of the eligible business population at the time. Now, the second lesson is that despite the low take-up, many of the guarantee programs were actually good value for money. In my research, we find that this was certainly the case for the UK. We show that the return to the guaranteed debt for the minority of businesses that took up the guaranteed loans were more than enough to have set the costs to the government of running the scheme. Now, what do we know about the guarantees that have been implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic? So contrary to the experience during the Great Recession, demand for these guarantees has been massive this time around. To give you some numbers, we know that in less than two months from their launch, approximately 400,000 companies applied for guaranteed loans in the UK, which is roughly 70 times the number of guaranteed borrowers during the entire year of 2009. Now the question is why, especially given the low take up of the schemes during the Great Recession. Now undoubtedly, as Erica was saying, an important part of the explanation is that this time around, the economic impact of the recession is much more severe for some businesses. For example, during lockdown, demand disappeared overnight for many businesses in the retail and restaurant sectors. 
However, another important explanation that I think is often overlooked is the design differences between the guarantees of the Great Recession and those during COVID-19. Across the board, what we have seen governments offer is what I'm gonna call streamlined guarantees. And they do so by relaxing the three policy levers that I mentioned. So for example, in the UK, this time around, the government is not charging a premium to firms, is offering a 100% guarantee to banks for most loans, and banks are not requesting personal guarantees from borrowers. Moreover, the government is also covering the first 12 months of interest payments and any lender charges, which altogether substantially lowers the upfront costs for borrowers of these guaranteed loans. So where does this leave us? So while the streamlined guarantees will provide the necessary funds for many businesses to survive during the crisis, I think there are three important considerations to keep in mind. So the first one is that loan guarantees are not useful for all eligible businesses. A good example of firms that are unlikely to use the guarantees are high growth young firms that typically fund themselves using private equity rather than bank debt. Why do we care about these firms, especially since they're so few in number? This is because they disproportionately contribute to economic growth. So it makes sense for governments to think of additional support facilities that specifically target them. Now the UK has taken steps in that direction and I have blogged about them in the LSE Business Review and I'm happy to talk more about them if this is interesting in the Q&A. Now the second consideration is that providing loan guarantees to firms will not protect the jobs of workers that are relatively easy to replace. This is because employers would rather not incur in debt today in order to retain staff during a recession if restaffing during the recovery is not very costly. So it definitely makes sense for the government to complement guarantees with the job retention programs that Erica was mentioning that can best help protect the livelihoods of workers in low training jobs. Now the UK has also taken steps in this direction and the demand for these schemes has also been unprecedented here and worldwide. But like guarantees, job retention programs also have issues. Primarily here is the risk of affecting productivity by preserving some jobs that in reality should disappear. Now, finally, the last consideration, and I have been building up from this to this from the beginning of my talk, is that streamlined guarantees can inadvertently set incentives for banks and borrowers to take risks, precisely because the levers to curtail those incentives have been relaxed in this crisis with the objective of reaching out to more businesses. Now, only time will tell whether the benefits from streamlined guarantees will compensate for the potential long-term difficulties when the loans come due for repayment in the future. But in my mind, this issue motivates policy proposals for the design of new bankruptcy procedures, as again, Erica was mentioning, which can help companies deal with that burden and reduce the cost of the bailout for taxpayers. Now, the UK is yet to make steps in this direction, although some European countries have. Uh, I'll now pass the mic to my colleague, Dimitri, uh, that can say more about this. Thank you. Thank you, Juanita. Um, uh, indeed, there are a number of questions also already that are coming on uh, loan guarantee schemes in developing countries. How does this work and so on? So um, while Dimitri is, um, uh, is talking, uh, please consider what can developing countries do that uh, either developed countries cannot do, perhaps because of online banking in some developing countries is uh, actually a larger share than in uh, developed countries. And conversely, what are the things that a country like the UK can do, but a developing country can, uh, cannot? Uh, Dimitri, to you, you have a very wide span of both research and uh, uh, policy work. Um, this crisis seems to be a lot larger than um, a previous crisis, but if any country and any work is uh, relevant, it's uh, Greece that for nearly a decade was going through a long and painful crisis, so perhaps there are some lessons there, both for the firms and how government uh, respond. Please. Okay, so thanks um, also from Mito for the invitation to be in this panel. I actually can pick up on a number of um, uh, issues that um, Erica and um, Juanita laid out. So in particular, that um, the idea that um, debt burdens are accumulating and uh, somehow um, the reduction of debt burdens has to be thought of uh, in, com uh, as a complement to whatever government assistance is being provided. So government assistance is, allows firms to cover uh, some of their operating costs on a temporary basis and can slow down the accumulation of uh, firms' obligations, but it cannot prevent that accumulation uh, or bring them to, to more sustainable level. So um, we have to think about ways to um, somehow to deal with this, uh, with the debt burden so in the private sector and find a way to um, 
uh, but for many of the firms to restore them to more viable level. So, the, so dealing with financial distress um, is generally done either through a liquidation or through reorganization. Now, for and this is the same the same in this crisis. So, some um, firms would not be able to have a, a profitable business model going forward. It's possible, for example, that some airlines um, will have to. Um, 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 be shut down even after the lockdown is lifted because there is just reduced demand for travel or uh, I don't know, some restaurants or some bars. But uh, for the majority of the firms in the economy, even in the, in the most heavily affected sectors, the um, financial distress that is caused by the uh, COVID crisis must be or addressed through reorganization because most economic activity will re resume after the lockdown is lifted. And um, therefore, uh, the, the effect of the crisis will be primarily to the firm's current revenue and not as much to their future revenue. So um, this does not mean that addressing the uh, financial distress is easy um, because um, there are two challenges. First of all, um, that um, uh, this financial distress is occurring throughout the economy at a massive scale. So there has to be some kind of, uh, the debt burdens have to be addressed across a huge number of firms. And um, the second uh, and related challenge is that this, as I said, as I just said, is that uh, most of in most case, in the majority of cases, the um, uh, way to go should be some kind of reorganization and the, uh, uh, as opposed to liquidation. Uh, so some kind of chapter 11 type procedure. And this, but these procedures are fairly complicated and in practice have been accessible to primarily the largest firms because of their complexity. So we have to find a way to do this um, debt restructuring, but in a way that uh, is more automatic and also kind of even small firms can benefit from it. So we, in um, some um, work that is um, co-authored with um, uh, Juanita, uh, Simeon, and um, another colleague of ours, Cynthia Ballock, we are proposing a, what we call a restart procedure that um, is a chapter 11 one and involves a, um, some kind of write down of that um, obli firm's obligations. It um, strips down some of the complexity of chapter 11 by making the write down of firm of the claims more automatic and um, using involving the uh, government claims in firms as a carrot and the automaticity is important given them how massive the, the debt restructuring must be uh, throughout the economy so just let me just sketch quickly the the key elements of our uh, uh, proposed procedure so we propose that firms that um, are unable to cover their obligations can elect to enter into a bankruptcy stay, an extended bankruptcy stay. So bankruptcy stay exists in many countries and allows firms to operate um, and protect them against uh, judicial actions, asset seizures, et cetera, by their creditors. Typically lasts for a few weeks or a few months. So um, we propose that it lasts for longer, for maybe closer to a year. Uh, and, and in fact, a number of countries have already extended uh, their existing bankruptcy stay to this kind of uh, length. So um, we propose that it's, it's extended because of the large uncertainty that is involved. We also propose that countries that don't have bankruptcy stay uh, consider in, introducing it as an emergency measure for a, for, for a comparable long period of time. And then uh, the second step is that um, this uh, bankruptcy stay is followed by a write down of firms obligations to their uh, creditors, landlords, suppliers. And uh, here is we propose that government the claims that governments held the, hold against firms uh, are used as a carrot for this process. So um, uh, what are the claims that governments hold, governments hold against firms? They include the unpaid uh, previous taxes, unpaid taxes, or social security contributions, perhaps loans made by government entities. So in many countries, these uh, government claims are senior to those of other claim holders. That's a typical situation. So the government must be paid first before anyone else is being paid. So we propose that uh, in this instance, kind of given this, uh, the challenge of this crisis, the seniority structure is made more symmetric. And uh, in particular, that reductions to private claims are accompanied automatically by reductions to claims made to the government. So the idea is that private claim holders would be more willing to write down their claims to, um, to firms if they know that such write downs would be accompanied by a write down of government claims. Now, just to be clear, this, um, uh, our procedure has a fiscal cost because uh, government claims to firms have to be written down, would, would be written down. Uh, there are two benefits. First of all, um, firms' financial viability would improve. And in some sense, this cost is, this benefit is similar to a kind of the current benefit of government assistance because government kind of 
stays, but it kind of ensures the viability of firms. At the same, kind of more importantly, there's a multiplier effect because the private claims to firms also would become smaller. The government would forego some claims, but also private firm, uh, private um, claim holders, landlords, banks, etc., would also forego some claims. So this multiplier effect is kind of key uh, to our procedure. And let me just close by just one issue about incentives, which is important, and this was already mentioned a bit uh, by Juanita, which is that uh, obviously one should think about uh, adverse incentive effects that um, kind of abuses of the procedure, even by healthy firms. We don't want healthy firms to be incentivized to use the procedure opportunistically to reduce firms uh, to reduce debts that they can that they can service. So uh, one kind of device could be to have a minimum payment. Uh, towards claims during the extended bankruptcy stay. And more importantly also, uh, there is a built-in feature in our procedure, which is that healthy firms would anticipate that private creditors would not agree to write down their claims if they know that the firms can service them, um, even if such a write down is accompanied by a write down of government claims. So in print, so under our, our procedure, healthy firms would have weaker effects or uh, would have weaker, weaker incentives or perhaps no incentives to um, to um, enter into that into our this procedure and kind of abusing it, so that's that's it for for now. And I can come back to if there are questions to that. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. So we have um, almost an hour for questions, um, which is exciting because we already have um, a number of them. Um, so I will distribute. Um, uh, I will distribute around. I will start with um, uh, Erica. And actually, the first question comes from Carmen S. dos Santos Monteiro on uh, differences between advanced and developing countries. Uh, you already started, Erica, in your uh, introduction to talk about uh, some of these uh, differences. But uh, as governments develop schemes in developing countries, what what should they look for? So what are some of the main features that may be different from the United States, Germany, uh, and so on? Erica, please. Thank you. Um, so crisis management, of course, in developing countries is more difficult than in advanced economies. Um, existing health infrastructure is usually more deficient. Food production and distribution are more easily disrupted. Um, thus threatening household living standards. But perhaps one of the larger difficulties governments have to face when devising policy for such countries is, that, is the larger share of the informal economy, uh, which means a higher cost of the lockdown and subsequent uh, social distances on businesses. So we have some research ex actually coming out just today uh, on this issue through LSE that exactly addresses um, the differences in crisis in crisis response between formal and uh, uh, sorry between countries with large uh, share of informality and countries with the lower share of informality. Um, just to set the stage of the problem, informality is huge in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, recent World Bank data that looks at the share of informality, especially in developing countries, finds that in some countries it can be as high as 98%. So to mean that 98% of the population between 15 and 64 years old tends to work uh, in the informal market. So businesses that are not registered essentially. Um, in 60 con 16 countries out of 52 that we look at, this share is above 90%. So that when governments think about uh, policy response, they really have to consider how can such policy response reach uh, these workers, and especially when such workers constitute such a majority um, of, the, of the labor force. Um, Workers in the informal businesses are essentially not able to take advantage of the various job retention schemes that the, that the government offers. Uh, so all of the schemes that we discussed before um, that I mentioned in relation to the UK, France, and many uh, high income economies have implemented become much more difficult to, um, to implement in these countries. Um, and workers are also not able to claim temporary unemployment benefits because they're just not registered. Um, business owners themselves have no recourse to credit guarantees or even small business grants or other popular government schemes. So um, in the face of these differences, more uh, 
policy response becomes more difficult. One option is for governments to view essentially informal businesses as households, so as providing uh, subsistence by livelihoods to poorer households and channeling money directly to um, individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juanita, I already uh, foreshadowed this question. Uh, a number of our participants uh, ask it in different ways, but uh, John Smith, an LSE student from Newcastle was uh, first. Uh, hi, John. Um, so given what I, you've just told us about the various uh, credit uh, guarantees or other uh, bank uh, credit or maybe other type of uh, credit uh, policies in your research, what needs to be done differently in this uh, in this crisis? So what are the policies that you saw before were not quite working, but clearly need to be uh, to be changed uh, now to have the biggest impact? Yeah, and thank you. And connecting as well with the question that we were asking me before about creating guarantee schemes in developing countries and in developed countries. Um, so you mentioned something that I really liked, which is the fact that in developing countries, there is a larger share of online banking, and this is crucial. And let me explain why. So one of the main difficulties faced by firms wanting to use the guarantees that I described has been this low speed of banks in processing applications. So the demand has been super high. Those were the numbers that I cited, but the actual number of loans that have been issued is much smaller. And it's all about the speed. Now the low speed is partly due to technological issues. So for example, different divisions in the old banks don't really talk to each other. So in practice, these institutions take very long times to assess an application. FinTech companies, on the other hand, are based on the premise of technology. And so the hope is that they will be better suited to deliver the cash to companies more quickly. And in the UK and other countries, this has already been implemented, but it's still early to tell whether these online banks have helped or not, but the hope is very high. So the first suggestion would be that emerging markets embrace FinTech companies and use them as a mechanism to deliver uh, the aid to companies through, for example, the loan guarantee programs. Now, what is different? Now, let's ask the opposite question. So what can developed countries do better than developing economies? So one of the many things that they can do better is that they can also offer the job retention schemes that I mentioned before. And this is crucial because what we showed in my research, as I was saying, is that Firms are not really willing to take on this debt to say, you know, keep their, retain their workers, unless replacing those workers in the future, if there is a recovery, is very, very hard. So the concern here is that in developing economies where countries may have less budget to offer this job retention schemes, the loan currency programs can actually be regressive because it is the poorer workers that typically hold the jobs that are and have low training costs. So that's, I think, gonna be a clear advantage, if you wanna call it that way, of developed countries over developing countries. Now, in terms of what could countries do, um, I really like one of the new policies by the UK government that is supporting the high technology companies that I was mentioning before. And again, this is one of those policies that it's developing countries, sorry, developed countries are in a much better position to, to offer them, however, it could be argued that developing countries are in a lot of need to offer policies that are targeted specifically to high growth firms. And the reason for that is that we have a lot of research that shows that you know, part of the reasons why developing countries grow at a lower speed or, or lo grow less in the past decades than developed economies is that the top percentile of firms grow much lower, um, uh, slower. And so, it, the policies that are really targeting the high growth young firms can make a very big difference. So how do they work? So in the UK, the government recently launched a fund that is called the Future Fund. And what this fund will do is that it will basically make investments in the form of convertible loans in high growth companies in the UK that have raised in the past at least £250,000 uh, in equity. And uh, I mean, this is a good policy in the sense that we already know that private equity markets are being affected. So I think this is a step in the right direction. This is something the government should be doing. But the concerns also arise with respect to how do you actually manage that fund. So one specific concern um, I, I would like to highlight is the fact that because these are convertible loans, 
If the firms are not able to pay the debt, say at maturity, these loans will immediately convert to shares. And so the concern that arises is what will the government do with the shares? As currently specified, the government has freedom to sell the shares in the future with very few restrictions. But you could imagine that this will affect the demand of certain firms that will worry about their shares being sold in the future to say potential competitors um, and which can affect their business going forward. So I think these kinds of policies can be very important. They will target companies that other types of policies do not. There are challenges in implementing them, um, uh, but you know, I'm looking forward to see what sort of changes the government may come up with in terms of policy design. Thank you. You mentioned who need uh, equity and uh, firms that may be worried who take that uh, equity um, after the crisis. In fact, there are a number of questions uh, directed to both you and Dimitri, but maybe Dimitri starts on this question. So Sandra Lobo, for example, asked the question uh, for Dimitri, uh, are you worried that with this financial distress uh, in developing countries, governments will end up taking over firms um, uh, and then what, how, how do you think of that uh, government being owners of firms? And also secondly, how can corruption be avoided in this, uh, both the allocation of loans, uh, which is a separate question, but in uh, this uh, ownership. So basically to maybe summarize it differently. So what is the end game? Suppose that through these schemes, uh, governments around the world, uh, but particularly in developing countries, as, as Sandra mentions, end up as uh, co-owners of uh, a number of, uh, of firms. What is the governing mechanism? Uh, what happens uh, next, both to Dimitri and Juanita? Dimitri, please. Yeah, OK, so that's an important question. In fact, um, in our proposal, we do not um, suggest that there, is a, that there are kind of generalized uh, debt equity swaps. So um, that, in other words, that um, the governments uh, take equity positions in firms. We just suggest that only that government obligations in uh, firms are um, being, um, debt obligations in firms are being written down uh, in parallel with um, uh, debt obligations by the private sector. So, um, so this is, so, but not that governments take any equity stakes uh, in exchange. Uh, precisely because we had in mind these uh, issues that would um, arise, the complexity that would arise with the uh, kind of governments owning states, stakes in a large uh, uh, part of the firms in the economy. So um, yeah, so that's our procedure is our proposed procedure uh, on uh, kind of the restart procedure is not about that, this debt equity swap. Um, so. Um, okay, but for Juanita, example, do, sorry. Um, is there experience from uh, previous schemes where this is, however, the case? And what, what do governments uh, do in terms of exit or in terms of governance mechanisms? Is there any so, research in this area? So in the previous schemes launched by the government to incentivize private equity markets, um, there wasn't a role for the government in buying shares in firms. So I would say that at least in the UK, there is very little experience um, in this topic. And I, I don't really know of any other uh, programs where the governments have bought shares, at least in the smaller firms, and have had to deal with getting rid of those shares later on by selling them to other investors. Yeah, I mean, we do, of course, know of uh, sovereign wealth funds like the Norwegian <laughs> fund, for example, that uh, is a minority shareholder in good times, I guess, as well as in, in bad times. But these are small minority shares that do not... Uh, impose some governance, hopefully better governance mechanisms, but do not uh, question the uh, ownership, so to speak, and the control of the companies. Here in this type of uh, uh, situation, difficult crisis situation, Sandra and others are right to um, wonder um, what happens if uh, through the various schemes, you suddenly end up with uh, significant uh, ownership and maybe some control over the companies. And the answer, I guess, is we know for large companies, for minority shares, how in principle processes can operate, but we're in fairly um, unusual times. Uh, so that's why this uh, event, and I'm sure many other events uh, that will follow to figure out exactly what are the schemes um, to make sure that uh, uh, a large number of companies first survive, and then we have some sort of an unwinding scheme. 
uh, which leads me to the next question, which is to uh, Erica from Anna Maria Pilati, who is an LSE alumna, is also studied at uh, UCL um, uh, and other places, who is asking, listening to your fascinating study, Erica, you're basically saying that a number of firms are effectively bust already. Um, um, so, and then you, on top of that, talked about the informal sector in many developing countries that are hand to mouth. So uh, they're experiencing already these difficulties that, uh, uh, that we are uh, uh, describing. So what do we do for these firms? Is there a quick policy, one that we've discussed or one that we have uh, yet to discuss? And I will just like to add uh, another question from Alistair Milne from, um, um, again, for Erica, which is who is basically asking about uh, public su support to GDP, uh, what can be done through procurement policies as well for small firms, for large, uh, uh, for large firms, and in this uh, urgency. Uh, perhaps Erica starts and then we'll go to the other participants. So we're really talking about, we'll by the way, go to sectors next. There are a number of questions on sectors. Thank you. No, this is this is a very good question. So some research that we've been done, doing right now that addresses uh, exactly this, these concerns is to see how governments around the world can essentially expediently uh, put money in the hands of the millions of firms that are struggling in, in this crisis. So one option that we, have, uh, that we have explored and we have research coming out in this direction is to use exactly public procurement and in general, more specifically like large or smaller infrastructure projects to do exactly that. So of course, public procurement is the process of doing business with the government and it's a massive source of a business for millions of businesses around the world. And the question that we posed ourselves, is there a way there to essentially push uh, money into the private sector through these activities? Uh, and since many governments are discussing restarting through public works and usually large infrastructure projects, what can be then the role of this uh, procurement mechanisms in this crisis management? Um, one very large uh, data set coming out of the World Bank shows um, how efficient governments are in paying bills uh, to the public, to the private sector. And it turns out that on average, they're not uh, very efficient. So the very vast majority of countries around the world take months um, to pay their bills vis-a-vis -vis the private sector. So one uh, measure that one could envision is for governments to just simply pay uh, what they have been owing the private sector. We have done some calculations in this direction using a sample of 187 countries, so nearly the totality of countries in the world, in the world and showing that if every government essentially paid the money that they owe, in 45 days, as opposed to the many more months that it usually takes, about $4.6 trillion would be pushed into the economy. Uh, so what this means is that if you look at um, public procurement as an industry, that's about an $11 trillion a year uh, industry, so about 12% of GDP on average worldwide is spent in public procurement. If governments became more efficient in paying their bills and paid at uh, a rate that is common to the speedier economies, um, all of this money would then be made available to the private sector. So one option that we've been uh, looking at through our research is, uh, is to promote businesses that way. So to prevent exactly the already busted effect that was mentioned in the comment. Thank you, Erica. Um, Dimitri, your this Having the model has raised a number of uh, questions. You're in trouble. Buying several questions. Sergey Chertishev. Uh, um, asked the question of the, 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 uh, the most. Uh, does this create some sort of an incentive uh, uh, problem? And then Marcus Miller from Warwick, again on, uh, on your proposal, uh, asks the question, what about debt in possession finance? Uh, you don't discuss this, you in some sense discuss basic write downs. Uh, 
what about uh, debt in possession, debt equity swaps? Uh, Juanita also mentioned. So maybe Dimitri, then Juanita, please. Okay, or, okay. Fine. These are good questions. So first of all, on uh, these incentives of healthy versus uh, 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 firms versus firms in trouble. I mean, I mean, just this is a feature of uh, any bankruptcy procedure that firms that that uh, the firms that get uh, uh, some debt relief are the firms that are in trouble. So healthy firms generally don't apply for uh, for to go to um, to enter into a bankruptcy procedure. Uh, only firms that are in, in, in trouble apply, and they get generally some uh, uh, write down of their debt if they manage to uh, st stay alive after the procedure. So in some sense, what we're proposing is not very different. It's just a procedure that um, uh, will involve some um, 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 reduction of debt. And uh, we just want to, make, so as any other bankruptcy procedure, and just uh, will, um, we just need to think about the incentives that not healthy firms would want to enter in that procedure. That's the spirit of the, of the procedure. So I, I kind of that's, this is what is, this is the general feature of, of, of bankruptcy procedures. Now, um, we, so on debtor in, debtor in procession financing, I think this has to be a feature of our procedure as well. That's that's unavoidable. And uh, and about debt equity swaps, um, so I guess that's a bit of an open question. So for we did not advocate that um, possi that possibility for the reasons that um, we discussed because of the kind of the massive um, kind of scale of this procedure. It has that it has to be applied so to so many firms across the economy. So it, and kind of how complicated it would be for the government to own stakes in so many firms. But um, anyway, that's something that we have to think about a bit more. And actually, we're talking about this between ourselves uh, recently. So it's not something we, don't, we have not ruled out completely. Juanita, do you have a comment uh, on this? And I um, would uh, use the opportunity to add another question, which we can start, which is on sectors. So we've discussed so far general schemes uh, of, of uh, firms in uh, uh, in distress, Emily Wolf, who is a PhD candidate from Leiden University. I've visited Leiden University, a great place. How are governments in Europe, and now actually expanded uh, beyond allocating capital across uh, across sectors? So what do we know across cross-sectoral uh, uh, distribution? Juanita. Schemes um, have very few restrictions with respect to the industry types that can apply. So through those mechanisms, there's no specific sector that is being targeted. But if you look at, for example, at the future fund, which is the other uh, mechanism I was describing this in the UK, that is specifically targeting firms that have raised private equity in the past. And these are disproportionately concentrated in certain sectors such as high technology, et cetera. Um, now there are some specific, um, like other types of policies that are targeting uh, certain sectors. I know less of them, but I think the motivation behind them is that, as Erica was describing in the beginning, we know that in this particular crisis, there are certain sectors that are highly affected. And so to go no further, we already mentioned, for example, retail, um, right, restaurants, bars, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with respect to debt and equity swaps, um, I think specifically for the case of the future fund, um, I think there are a couple of things to mention. So the first one is that, as I said, the government will make investments in convertible notes in these firms, and which will convert into shares if the notes are not prepaid. What's interesting, however, is that the actual um, um, terms of the scheme, what they say is that uh, there's gonna be um, a premium that companies will have to pay over and above the debt. In particular, um, the debts, the convertible notes have a 100% premium, which means that for firms to avoid the conversion, they will have to pay twice what they borrowed, plus the 8% of interest associated with those convertible notes. Now, this is not standard in a convertible uh, note, at least not such a high premium. And, and this is important because uh, not only are these firms expecting to, I mean, they don't really know what to expect about what's gonna happen in the future. So they don't know whether they're gonna have enough money to pay, um, you know, these kinds of, 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 of fees. But in addition to that, my own research also shows that many of these firms, while they raise funds from private equity markets, 
many of the investments that are made in these firms are in the form of debt-like instruments. And so the concern here will be that if you're a startup and you've raised financing from angels, and some of this financing has been in the form of notes, and now the government comes along and invests in the company in the form of this convertible notes with such a high premium, the notes of the existing angels will be subordinated. And it's gonna be very hard to get these angels to be very enthusiastic about receiving these funds from the government. So that's kind of like one aspect of the future fund that is very specific to this debt equity transaction uh, that occurs in the fund. The second one has to do with what I was describing before. So imagine that as a firm, you're able to convince your business angels to, you know, to, to, to go for uh, this future fund investment. I think another important concern is that in the future, if indeed uh, the loan is converted into shares, as I said, the government doesn't have much restrictions of who to transfer these shares. And this is important because private equity markets are not very deep. So the question is, who are the typical buyers of these shares? I think it's unlikely that it will be the same business angels that are already financing these firms. It's going to be hard for the government to go out and seek these business angels. So it is more likely that the government will be sending lots of these shares, right? So packages of these shares to say institutional funds. And it's likely that some of these firms don't feel ready or they don't want to be uh, owned by these funds just yet. We know that there's a life cycle of when you actually want to reach for venture capital money. So that's another consideration to have in mind in the specific case of the future fund and the debt equity swaps um, in, in, in that case. Thank you, Juanita. I would actually take one question from Vasco Raju on the size of packages in uh, developing and developed countries in crisis response. But before I do that, uh, actually all the panelists, you all have worked uh, in the area of insolvency. So I'll combine two questions. Uh, Dania Thomas from Glasgow, for example, says, are the insolvency courts in the UK and I'll say anywhere else in the world equipped to operationalize the proposal discussed by Dimitri? Um, uh, is there another institutional framework that needs to be set up to handle um, tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, cases. I know Juanita has a paper, her most recent work on uh, insolvency, which we have all worked in this uh, area. So please uh, uh, think on that for a moment. Uh, Vasco Raju is asking a very good question. So what is the size, what is the right size uh, and what's the actual size so far that we've seen um, across, um, uh, across different uh, countries. Um, so in, um, the rich countries, G7 uh, countries, and uh, more generally Europe uh, as well, we've seen very large packages. So if you put together everything that has been adopted with legislation, so not just uh, everything that has been promised, but actually that uh, has been adopted by parliaments in countries like the UK, US, uh, France, uh, uh, Germany, um, uh, the Netherlands, uh, so far, the packages only so far constitute 15 to 20 percent of GDP on an annual basis. So huge packages. And these packages go in the directions that were already described. A lot of it so far goes in job retention schemes, uh, which uh, in the US and in the UK are close to 30 percent of the labor force by now, between 25 and 30 percent of the labor force in the United Kingdom and the United States, in some form depends currently on government um, assistance in countries like France and Germany, it's close to 20 percent. And the rest of the European Union is quickly catching up. Uh, so very, very large packages. Incidentally, only uh, today the European um, uh, Council has adopted an additional measure of uh, close to 600 billion euro, essentially in support of, um, of uh, job retention schemes, on top of another half a trillion that was uh, adopted about a month ago. So these are very popular, um, uh, very popular schemes in uh, advanced economies. Uh, however, as Eric already mentioned, once you have a large share of informality in your country, which not just poor countries, but also many middle income countries have. Give you one example with Brazil, the statistics are that around 40% of the workers are in informal companies, meaning they don't have access to 
social protection, social insurance, and do not have access to this type of schemes. Once you go to a country like India, about 90% of the labor force uh, uh, is uh, in the informal economy. And hence, the schemes that developing countries are proposing, um, uh, even if uh, some of them sound large, I mentioned India, which uh, by proposal is offering something close to 12% 12 of, uh, of GDP, so more than 10% of GDP in the combination of uh, schemes related to job retention, um, direct cash transfers, as well as bank guarantee schemes of the type that uh, Juanita was mentioning. If you, however, look at this type of package, you see in a number of countries, Nigeria, um, uh, India, um, uh, many of the African countries, because the mechanisms to in fact, uh, 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 if you like, uh, do, this, uh, do this aid effectively or, 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 or distribute these uh, resources effectively are not really there. They need to be created on the go you see much, much, much smaller take-ups. So in the case of India, there are some calculations by uh, colleagues of ours that suggest that out of the 10 to 12% of GDP package, only about two, two and a half percentage points of GDP can actually be um, uh, easily disseminated, if you like. And the rest, we need to think of, uh, of, new, uh, of new channels. But to your question, rich countries, 15 to 20 percent that we know of, and this is noticed, this is two, three months into the crisis. It does not take into account the large uncertainty that still exists on the next few weeks and uh, months. Southern Europe so far, because of more limited fiscal space, so countries like uh, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, even though the health crisis is very significant and they're spending a lot of money on the health crisis itself, so far, the economic response uh, uh, has been much, much smaller, so in the order of 5% of GDP. But these countries are awaiting the overall European response, which, as I mentioned just today, there are some, uh, some further uh, decisions. And once you go to um, developing countries, so far, at least the average response, uh, both the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are keeping um, statistics on this is in the order of anywhere between three and 8%. So about half to a third of what uh, advanced economies offer. And this again is a combination of smaller fiscal space. Many developing countries actually already had debt burden problems before the crisis. Uh, so the fiscal space is not, uh, not there, but in my mind, much more importantly and much more urgently uh, uh, needs to be um, uh, configured or reconfigured is what are the mechanisms through which you reach uh, you reach businesses? What are the mechanisms through which you uh, you reach households? And many of these are not the traditional mechanisms that uh, that we would see. Back to insolvency. Maybe we start with Juanita, who has a paper on an advanced economy, but maybe we can learn from it. Sure, absolutely. Um, so in terms of insolvency. So let me start by saying that indeed, I know of proposals already for the US where uh, the idea is to either have special courts or special guidance for businesses on how to actually go about dealing with as many uh, bankruptcy filings if they do occur. And this is not necessarily surprising because if you look at the developed economies as the one in which I wrote my paper, which is Denmark, uh, even though many of them offer uh, reorganization procedures, um, the take up of these procedures is often not very high. So for example, in Denmark, there was a change of regulation that um, increased you know, control rights of creditors during reorganization after the financial crisis. And in spite of the changes, we still see that very few firms, I think it's like less than 4%, uh, firms that liquidate in Denmark actually go through a reorganization procedure. So there's an argument to be said that even if the procedures already exist in a country, it's likely that the knowledge on how to use them, how to apply them, how to renegotiate a debt, uh, how to structure these things may not be there uh, um, to use and to tap uh, during the crisis. So there is something to be said about um, having like a special um, um, support program for the government to build up on that knowledge. Um, now, in terms of what we actually find in that paper, 
what we find is that um, the changes of insolvency procedures can actually have very important uh, ex effects on the ex-ante incentives of uh, the agents in an economy. So in particular, what we find there is that when there is a change in the procedure that increases the control rights that creditors have to reorganization because they can implement their own uh, restructuring plans and because they can uh, um, um, fire the manager if the manager is not happy with the reorganization plans that the creditors propose. So after that change, what we see is that very few firms go through reorganization procedure, as I mentioned, but there's this big impact on how solvent firms, so those that are far from bankruptcy, behave. And in particular, we find that they improve very much their financial management. So they have more debt at better terms, they pay it at a higher frequency, they invest more, and these are all what I described are these like ex ante incentive effects because these are things that are happening to firms when they're far from bankruptcy. So how is this related to what we were just discussing? So, you know, as you know, as Dimitri was saying, there's a proposal, we have an idea of a proposal uh, to implement a restart procedure. Now, there, some of these things are happening in other countries. So in Germany and, and in France, and I think in Spain, some efforts are being done in that direction. So what I would say is that what we have to think about is what are the incentives that these things can set for agents in the economy? So for sure, I think uh, setting up this uh, kinds of, you know, the restart procedure, for example, will help the companies that are now in trouble. And that's very important. But we want to make sure that the way that we structure that procedure is not going to affect the incentives of other agents in the economy too much. So you could imagine that uh, firms that do not necessarily need to go through this procedure because they're solvent, they're doing okay, as Dimitri was saying, may be tempted to go through it. But above and beyond that, they may also be tempted to take more risks, knowing that if things turn out badly, at least in these times, there is a way to somehow you know, get off the hook. And you can imagine creditors reacting to this and as a consequence, extending less loans, increasing the interest rates, and perhaps inadvertently generating problems for firms to raise money. So as always with policy, this is a trade-off. It's not an easy way to design, but I think the optimal policy is going to trade off this, this, you know, these kinds of things, uh, you know, the benefits of helping firms that are in trouble right now and speeding up the process, et cetera, with the complicated incentives that this can set for other agents in the economy. Um, there are actually several questions that rather than talking about smaller firms, talk about the very large firms. So there is a question from Isabel Bagnasco on the GM bailout in the United States uh, in the previous uh, crisis. There are several questions on the airline uh, industry and the various bailouts that is in effect already have happened in, uh, in a number of countries, uh, in the UK, in, uh, in Germany, in the US and the discussions. So Dimitri, under the scheme that you're, you're describing, it does not differentiate by size. So large firms as well as medium size uh, firms can uh, participate. We've agreed that for small firms, they may be, um, uh, the costs are maybe too high or they may be um, uh, just a lot of uncertainty, but would very large firms also participate in this, uh, in this process? And uh, an additional question specific to Greece, in the previous crisis, was that an issue in Greece, how to handle large firms and how was it resolved? I think that um, there was not um, a, a, a differentiation, an explicit differentiation in Greece between uh, large and small firms. So let me start about this, uh, this Greece part of the question. So just to, for everybody's benefit, the, uh, so Greece went through some similar uh, experience uh, before the COVID crisis in terms of the uh, amount of uh, insolvency in the economy. About 50% uh, of uh, loans in the banking system were non-performing. So half of one out of two loans was non-performing. And so the, um, the, the kind of major changes to the bankruptcy code were, uh, uh, instituted to deal with this uh, massive uh, amount of non-performing loans relative to kind of an economy that was used to having uh, like 5% of non-performing loans or so kind of typically. So, and um, coming back to the um, 
this procedure that we are that I sketched um, and I was talking about the seniority of state I will come back to firm size in a minute but in terms of the seniority of the state claims uh, there was a change in the law that um, made uh, claims of the state in uh, firms of equal seniority as the claims to um, I think to secured creditors or to uh, some other kind of fairly senior creditors so um, so and the the explicit purpose of that change in the law was to facilitate um, the um, um, renegotiation of debt claims. So, so something like that, in other words, that we're proposing to make debt, the claims by the government less, uh, not to give them kind of full priority, is something that has been done in, in response to uh, such a kind of massive uh, crisis. Now, uh, coming to your other questions, Simon, about firm size and uh, the policies that we are suggesting, so I guess we had in mind primarily smaller firms or medium-sized firms. We didn't have in mind maybe kind of the largest firms. So we, mainly because there are not kind of just the number of these uh, of these smaller firms and medium-sized firms are are so large, and their uh, ability to access kind of Chapter 11 type procedures is, is small. So we thought that uh, uh, we had to make these procedures smaller, uh, kind of more efficient, more automatic, and uh, so that, that these firms can uh, can benefit from it. So um, maybe there is not, and this is something that kind of needs more uh, discussion, maybe there's not an, uh, as much of a need to tinker with uh, existing procedures for the largest firms. So that's my... And large firms, I should add, also have cross-border, uh, typically have cross-border subsidiaries and so on that uh, create uh, create issues that uh, are not subject to just one particular government or one particular insolvency uh, uh, insolvency system that I guess in the model that we're describing, that's a bit too sophisticated. But I would worry less about large firms because they have lots of well-paid lawyers, so they probably can <laughs> figure, <laughs> figure out the system. It's the hundreds of thousands of small and medium-sized firms that uh, are totally surprised in this crisis and need, uh, need a, a way out. Shifting direction towards uh, developing countries, Elvira Mami, an LSE alumnus as well, PhD student currently, towards Erica, what is the view on the impact on inequality from the current crisis? And since probably there is a big impact on inequality, what do we do uh, to minimize that impact? Yes, no, that's a, an excellent question. Of course, the current crisis does um, increase inequality. I think there is no way out there. Uh, some of the numbers I mentioned on informality earlier in a way go exactly to that point. So um, in poorer countries, but as uh, Simon mentioned earlier, sometimes even in uh, middle income countries, all workers that um, are not formalized have suddenly much less access to everything that is uh, job retention schemes and unemployment benefits firms themselves have less access to credit guarantees and grants. So of course the crisis will in fact um, increase inequality. One option to address that is through cash transfers. Um, so what some governments have been experimenting with is with um, direct, cash trans uh, direct cash transfers to households. Um, that in turn poses other difficulties. You were mentioning earlier India, um, which is a country where the percentage of unbanked, for example, is still very high, despite government programs that have now uh, considerably um, acted towards uh, filling that gap. Um, but one option, one issue there is, is then how do you reach people. Um, so once you have um, people's banking information, for example, through um, using such banking information to disburse other um, social security contributions, then you can access them through those kind of mechanisms. But whenever that's not the case, that poses a problem of its own. So um, one way to start, but of course, um, a real concern. Yeah. Um, shifting now regions, a question from Dubai, Jawad Jamil, um, asking the question, I guess this is a variation again on the model that we are describing. So why not use the banks? I'm paraphrasing the question. Why not use the banks rather than thinking of uh, more institutional mechanisms like insolvency, which in many regions in the world, including in the Middle East, are actually very recent in terms of reorganization procedures. 
um, so this is both towards Juanita and Dimitri, can one conceive of a scheme where the government essentially pumps liquidity into the banking system, uh, the commercial banking system, and asks the banks, you deal with this, or you handle the, uh, the firms that are anyhow your clients, so you make sure that they, are, uh, they survive this, uh, this process basically through redressing banks' balance sheets uh, rather than coming with a uh, more across-the-board scheme. Juanita, maybe? Yeah, I mean, yes. So I think that one issue with that sort of policy, there may be more, but one, I think, one important issue is that at the end of the day, banks have to do their business, which is taking an assessment of risk. So if governments only provide the funds, but they don't provide, for example, guarantees, then I find it unlikely that banks will use this money to reach as many businesses as possible and help them go and get through um, the recession. So in fact, uh, one parallel to that is what has happened in the UK. So when the, when the loan guarantees were originally implemented uh, back in March, the idea was for the guarantee to still be partial. So it went from 70%, which is the typical guarantee that the government uses before COVID-19 for these kinds of programs to 80%. But there was a lot of pressure to change that guarantee from 80 to 100. And that came from the part of banks that said, look, there's a lot of uncertainty. So if I have to take a good measure of risks that these companies are facing, I will still very, un very likely not give them a loan, even if you provide us with 80% guarantee. So imagine that you think about the, the program that uh, the, the, the question was suggesting, where there is no guarantee at all. Um, I suspect that banks are not gonna use it to, 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 to take this money and send it to perhaps companies that are in much need of them. Very good. And while well, you have the floor, um, Juanita, there are several more questions towards you. Um, they essentially all have to do with, again, maybe um, saying a bit more on how the current crisis is different from the previous crisis that you studied. So Chadi Miro, for example, asks, what are the differences between the 2020 and the, 20, the 2009 crisis in terms of what the government response should be? And then there is a similar question from Sami Ramanzai, um, who is an LSE uh, alumni, so what's different in the COVID-19 uh, crisis? You already touched upon some of this, but maybe now that we've evolved and also spoken about insolvency and other schemes, you can um, go again through the main differences. Um, well, to me, I, I guess the most important difference is that in COVID-19, this is a massive negative demand shock for firms. And so that has to be dealt with very differently from the financial crisis where we didn't have this fall in demand at a massive scale in the entire economy, but rather the problem started in the financial sector. So I think this explains why, as I was describing in my opening remarks, you see such fundamental changes in the way that governments are providing the support packages for companies. So in the UK, as I said, there's this big change in how the loan guarantees are, are you know, structured. They're much more generous, at least in paper, in order to reach many businesses. And this is relative to what was happening in the financial crisis. Also in UK, we didn't have any of the job retention programs. And this is true for many of the countries, precisely for the same reason. So again, when you have this massive uh, demand shock, one of the easiest ways to cut costs for companies is to fire employees. And as a consequence, uh, this is why I think that governments now are putting much more emphasis in the job retention schemes that I think back in the financial crisis were part of what Germany's support package, but wasn't a, a mainstream or such a prevalent policy as it is today. So, there's definitely, I would say, two ways in which governments are addressing the differences between the two crises. They're making the packages that they were offering in the crisis a bit different to increase the take up and much more generous for firms. In addition to that, they're offering other types of schemes that they didn't offer before 
which are targeting specifically the ability of companies to retain workers, even if they're not needed right now to meet the demand, precisely because of this negative shock. Yeah, no, very, um, a very good uh, summary. So I want to spend the last 10 minutes or so discussing life after COVID, if we can uh, imagine it, um, because there are at least two dozen questions on what does this change in the financial sector, in the real uh, economy? So all of the panelists should start thinking big. Uh, before I go there, I just wanted to uh, quickly cover two or three questions still focused on the model that uh, Dimitri uh, uh, described as well as Juanita. Um, so debt equity swaps, Marcus Miller is super excited about debt equity swaps. We discussed this, uh, uh, this already uh, a bit. Um, so he's asking, as far as I understand, it's just too complicated to, to, to do this, uh, given the scale of, uh, of the issue. Is that, Dimitri, uh, the main reason why we are shying away from it? Or is there some incentive compatibility reason or other reason as well? We had in mind uh, for a kind of as a large part of the participants, kind of smaller firms for which uh, it was difficult kind of for the government to hold equity kind of in this, I don't know, in a restaurant or something. So, or, or, even, for, or even for private creditors, not only the government, okay, let's put, out, let's put aside the government, even the private creditors to hold equity in, uh, in small firms. So um, this, is, this was one of the reasons why we, why we didn't think about the equity swaps. Now, kind of, if we go to kind of medium-sized firms, uh, then perhaps this could be a, a possibility, especially as, um, as uh, if, this, if the equity kind of is to be held by the private creditors. So this is something that I think we should consider, but, uh, but not for the smaller firms. And, and related again to your comments, again, again Sergey comes back, uh, Chair Tishev, Chapter 11 is a consensus procedure between the creditor company and other uh, stakeholders like unions and so on. Here, as we understand, you're basically suggesting that the government basically uses its um, ability because it has deferred taxes. So in some sense, it's a senior uh, creditor almost to cram down on others uh, and say, this is what I'm willing to offer if you go with it. Is that like what's new in this proposal relative to um, a normal proposal? We're proposing that the, the, just the seniority of claims changes. We don't, we're not proposing for the government to coerce any uh, reduction in, in, the, in the value of, of, any other of anybody else's claims. The government to force the reduction of, uh, I don't know, the, uh, what is owned to landlords or what is owned to, uh, to banks. We just, we just say that, uh, I mean, creditors can still decide whether uh, to accept the reorganization plan. We do, this is still their option. We just say that the government can use its uh, stake just as a, as a carrot. Say so if you do that, we're also going to reduce ours. So it's just a, a change in the in the in the seniority structure, just by putting the government a bit below. And this is not something crazy. I mean, this has something that has happened in in other countries, as, as I mentioned, in, at times of extreme crisis. Yeah. No, indeed. In this crisis, it may need to be taken at much larger scale and at, in many countries simultaneously. Previously, it's been more of a regional approach or specific countries. Well. Here we are talking potentially of many countries making these steps um, uh, at the same time. Just as Juanita mentioned, when the German scheme from the last crisis, the Kurzarbeit uh, short uh, work uh, uh, so-called scheme uh, was uh, created in Germany 10, 12 years ago, it was the only country that was using it. And the scheme was credited as uh, significantly reducing uh, unemployment during the Eurozone uh, crisis. Other European countries learned from this. And it, it is the most popular scheme that every European country in some format has, but many other countries have, uh, have too. So we do learn um, during a, a crisis and that's, that's uh, one scheme that has uh, succeeded. Again, to the formal sector, you get the issue that in many of the developing uh, world, the only formal businesses are large international companies um, uh, and then uh, uh, some service sector businesses that uh, also are contractors and so on. So you're not taking into account a very large part of the population. There you need to work through um, conditional cash transfers or even unconditional cash transfers and see how you reach this, uh, uh, this very significant part of the population. 
So we have uh, a few minutes at the end to talk about the future. So the crisis is here, many countries are fighting it successfully, the recovery hopefully starts um, uh, very soon and we're successful there. So how is the financial sector different? How is the economy different uh, after that? But since we're talking about governments, basically how are governments reacting uh, differently in the future? I'm summarizing a number of questions here. Is the share of the economy larger? Lee, for example, is asking this. Greta Paul is asking a similar question. So is the government a much larger, the state a much larger part of the economy and in which ways? We'll start with uh, Erica. Yes, so um, now that we're starting to see countries devising policies for restart, we see that, for example, a lot of them, and bringing it back to the procurement discussion we were having earlier, a lot of them are bringing it back to large infrastructure projects. So, so how do we use these infrastructure projects? How do we use contracts with governments uh, and the government as an employer ultimately to restart the economy? Um, one interesting question that is starting to, to come up is then, what is the role? What is the role of existing rules in this uh, in this setting? So, existing rules on government procurement, government business tend to be quite binding and burdensome for governments. But in a moment in which we want to restart operations quickly, is there room to relax such rules in favor of the emergency situation we're living? And we're seeing some countries doing exactly that. Um, Italy has done uh, some such relaxation even before the crisis is in rebuilding the Genova bridge that, um, that has collapsed. So there has been discussion about the then the uh, discretion and autonomy that we can give governments in implementing existing rules when restarting the economy. Um, in a way, the level that level of discretion and the increasing level of discretion comes with risks of its own. Um, using such measures excessively can also open other problems and it's directly linked also to um, public sector capacity. So that in countries with higher public sector capacity, we would um, see discretion as being um, perhaps a bigger option. So relaxing these rules can be uh, more more can lead to better uh, better outcomes in better outcomes in restarting the economy, but that could be less true in uh, low income and developing countries. So we will definitely yes to see uh, the government probably be a better a bigger player, um, but under which framework I think is up for discussion and very much dependent on country characteristics. Juanita, any uh, views on this topic specific to the financial sector, but also more generally? So, yeah, I mean, I think that the government will have a prominent role um, in, the, in the years to come, if no less, um, because if, you know, if, if these kinds of programs that we were discussing in particular that involve debt equity swaps take hold of, of you know, take on in economies, then one would imagine that the role of the government will be very important in figuring out how to, um, you know, sell those positions uh, that the government may have purchased in companies or even, you know, as in the financial crisis in banks, etc. So there's definitely something to be said about that. But the government support cannot last forever. Um, so at some point, we're going to have to start thinking, how will the business model of certain companies will have to change if, uh, you know, norms for social distancing are here to, to stay with us and and who are going to be the you know the the big winners and the big losers um, in, in in this economy? And I can already tell you, as some of you may know, that many of the high technology companies are actually benefiting because their business model is precisely to say help out individuals connect with each other. For example, Zoom, as we're all using it right now, but also you know companies as Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. So there's also something to be said about um, the big technology companies that may grow even bigger and how will they interact with the government going forward and for the small businesses like restaurants um, bars again if social norms are here to stay will the government have a role in 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 making sure that these norms are being satisfied in these businesses what form will that take and and uh and how will we make sure or how will these businesses make sure that they can survive in this new normal i don't know 
It's a very good point, very uh, significant research uh, in the real economy uh, after the last crisis that basically found this at first pass obvious um, uh, result, which is that much higher concentration across the board, every industry, financial industry, um, uh, shipping industry, uh, trading across borders, a uh, few companies, chemical industry. So after the previous uh, crisis, there was, uh, there was a very significant concentration. So the larger firms became larger. Uh, uh, and in this crisis, as Juanita just, uh, uh, just mentioned, is not only large firms, but firms that have the technological advance, uh, advances and uh, ability to um, deal with social distances or indeed to benefit from uh, social distancing because uh, they are primarily online. So we can see quite high levels of concentration, which at first uh, are good because we're getting uh, services that probably otherwise we wouldn't and goods, but then give us pauses because uh, they also create a lot of um, a lot of issues. And indeed, this is one of the topics that governments uh, should start uh, should start considering. Uh, Dimitri, uh, on this point, we started in some sense with Greece and in a way we're also ending with your experience from um, Greece. So if one can think of a country that went through a pro prolonged painful uh, uh, crisis um, that we can learn from. So this is uh, uh, Greece. What changed after this crisis? So did the government uh, uh, engagement in the economy change substantially? Did institutions change? Is, is, is a country like Greece after this previous crisis better able to deal with such uh, shocks? Well, actually Greece dealt with that particular shock reasonably well until now. So it's one of the success stories of the, uh, of this, um, of the, of the pandemic in terms of, um, kind of this, how, how the pandemic was uh, controlled. Uh, I guess part of it was because people were more willing to, uh, the public was more willing to listen to a, <laughs> to a kind of to, to follow severe measures after the experience of following severe, kind of severe measures during the austerity year. So the, the government told them to stay at home and they were just listened and they kind of, they did not question that. So, um, but um, um, yeah, now in terms of, in terms of the role of the government, I, I, no, I think the role of the government, there was not, there was not a kind of a drastic uh, change in the role of the government actually, uh, but okay, I think this is, maybe it's a bit different, uh, maybe it's making the comparison is a bit tricky for, with the current crisis, but, uh, uh, but the role of the government has kind of stayed more or less the way it was and, um, before and, uh, and, and now. Uh, the, um, I think that what is important and certainly is important for Greece, but also for other countries is the, uh, what Juanita said about companies, uh, applies also to countries that the countries, uh, some countries will uh, kind of lose quite a lot from this uh, crisis. So, uh, I mean, Greece apply, kind of countries that rely, rely quite a lot on tourism, for example, is going to be quite bad for them because the kind of, uh, the, the, kind of uh, it's an it's a industry that is going to be hit by, the, by COVID for many years. And um, uh, countries that uh, rely more on manufacturing will be less affected. So, um, and uh, I think countries will have to think a bit more carefully about uh, diversifying um, across in their diversification pattern across industries and how much they depend on specific industries. I think this was kind of a, such a big shock to the world economy that uh, um, kind of various types of risk and the risk exposures became quite apparent. Yeah, no, indeed. I would use the last minute to just summarize some of the topics and undoubtedly we'll be uh, seeing you over the next uh, weeks and months more because this is still uh, uh, developing. Um, but one, one uh, feature of crisis response that is becoming very apparent, and I hope in the discussion today it's been sufficiently highlighted, is advanced economies, because of the av availability of fiscal space, more fiscal space, and also the fact that they have various uh, channels for reaching both businesses and uh, households, uh, can do certain things that developing countries cannot yet do in this crisis, but maybe they can develop uh, 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 on the go, such uh, channels for online applications and so on. But crisis responses so far have been markedly different in advanced versus uh, developing uh, uh, countries. New business models are starting to develop both in how countries are responding, but also how businesses are uh, responding. 
and that may over time create uh, some new and high levels of concentration uh, in certain industries that uh, then would worry uh, uh, governments. But at the first pass, uh, this seems to be uh, helpful in the crisis response. What we didn't discuss, because we don't know much about it, is the uncertainty in the next weeks and months. Because uh, now we're assuming, a, uh, if you like, a linear model where the crisis, uh, the, the crisis response, uh, the health crisis response has been um, successful in most countries in the world or is being successful. And then uh, we go to the recovery phase. Our medical colleagues, of course, have uh, a number of questions whether it's as uh, linear or whether we can expect some uh, unpleasant surprises uh, in the near uh, future. And that, of course, can create a completely different uh, uh, situation in terms of how uh, governments and businesses are responding. Uh, but, that, uh, but that topic we uh, still uh, see as, uh, uh, as one that uh, with everybody else we are learning about. Um, so for now, I want to thank all the participants from all of us at LSE for participating in this. Stay safe wherever you are. I see uh, people in many countries around the world asking questions. We will try to answer some of the other questions uh, online. Um, but best wishes for now uh, for all of us, uh, from all of us at LSE. Thank you for participating. And thank you to the panelists, Erika, Juanita, Dimitri, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.